Joan Agajani and Quinn is the former West Coast editor of Andy Warhol's Interview Magazine and society editor of the Herald Examiner. Her cover stories are seen in Venice and Detour magazines, and she is a contributing editor to Angelus Magazine. For the next half hour, Joan will bring you inside news and views on society, art, film, and the exhilarating worlds of these multifaceted people. Here is Joan Quinn. Welcome to Etc. Our guest is actress Brenda Vaccaro. Brenda was born in Brooklyn and raised in Dallas. She went back to New York to study for the theater. And did she work? She worked a lot there and a lot in Hollywood. She's a true veteran who has been recognized in each category of the entertainment industry. Let me just read some of these things for you. She was nominated for a Tony for How Now Dow, Dow Jones. She was also nominated for The Goodbye People. She won a Tony for The Cactus Flower. She had an Emmy nomination for Best Actress in Her Own Series on TV called Sarah. She won an, uh, an Emmy Award for Best Supporting Actress in The Shape of Things, which was directed by Lee Grant. She had an Academy Award nomination in 1976 for uh, the Best Supporting Actress in Once Is Not Enough, and she won the Golden Globe that year. Brenda, Hi. I'm exhausted from all the work you've done. <laughs> Tell me, your career has seemed to go in spurts, though. You've, you've taken over each section of the entertainment world. Well, I've certainly done theater and television and film, which is, uh, I think, uh, a very juicy way to go about it. I mean, we, 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 like to, we like to travel and we like to do all kinds of uh, different mediums of the, of the business. So I feel I've been fortunate. When did you come to Hollywood from New York? Uh, I came to Hollywood, I think, in 1971 or 72, and oh my God, it's so long ago. What are we in oh, 2010? Yeah, but but was the, the John Schlesinger movie a turning point for you? Oh yes, indeed it was. Yeah, because I had been doing theater for like 10 years up until the time that I met John Schlesinger, and oh, the first film that I did actually was a Garson Kanin film called Where It's At. And that was in Vegas with D David Jensen, and Darling oh, David. You, you did that? Oh. I did that first, and then I went immediately to New York, back to my home, oh, and did I Midnight see. Cowboy. Yeah. Oh, I see. That was in 69, though. And you met Danny then? I met Danny Jensen. Uh, no, actually, uh, you mean Danny. Danny, Danny Jensen. Our Danny Needham. Our, yes. She's been married several times. Yes. <laughs> um, uh, let's see. I met Danny, I think, somewhere after doing Where It's At with David Jensen. Uh, because yeah. I know when we were talking, she, you know, says, she knows your mother. She yes, knows, like, we go the back family. a long time, yeah. She yeah. talked about Christine and the rest. She was restaurant. Danny Greco then. Oh, right. Now That's she's right. truly Danny Diamonds. But <laughs> <laughs> there's no woman in Hollywood that has more diamonds than Danny Jansen. And she sparkles. Yeah, she's she? a she's great lady. Beautiful. We love yeah. her. She's a good friend I of know, ours. She boy. really is. Yeah. Oh, so then when you came back to Hollywood. Right. You started making movies and yes. doing TV. Yes, that's when I moved. I left New York. And mm. uh, actually, it was tough in those days in New York because there had been an equity strike, and, and uh, I found myself going up for voiceovers for turkeys. <laughs> and there wasn't a lot of work for actresses there or actors. And so I found that the majority of the work began to happen out in Los Angeles. And uh, so I, be I moved out here to start working. And indeed, the work started flowing. So but you, you've done a lot of work as we talked about and you are really a veteran an, yeah, accomplished, an, an, an accomplished actress though Thank at a you. very young age have you seen um, changes in this casting system um, quite a bit actually I think the majority of the casting people that I have met they don't know me and I don't know them and uh, so that makes it very interesting right there. I mean, I think I heard the most phenomenal thing the other day that sort of relates to this conversation, which was that there were a group of people at a studio who asked for Maximilian Schell's <laughs> resume, That's which I think is the most extraordinary <laughs> statement of the 90s. And perhaps I, 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 I lent my, my uh, opinion at the moment and said, well, did you tell them it was as long as La Cienega? So that I found that astounding, you know. So there are a lot of people that are in the business now who are younger, who are maybe not as educated as they should be in terms of the majority of veterans' work. Or yes, yeah, and so therefore the you run up against a, a lack of knowledge on some occasions. 
but uh, look, yeah, <laughs> you maybe a lot of occasions. <laughs> but uh, anyway, we get through that. We get through that. But you still have to audition. You said <laughs> yes. Oh no, it's the most phenomenal thing. I mean, uh, not that auditioning is phenomenal, <laughs> but it's like no matter what your amount of work is, and this these days now they want you to come in and they want you to read in in Hollywood. Some people. Now, there are people like Tony Richardson who likes to sit and have a chat, Peter Yates who likes to sit and have a chat, and these gentlemen are wise enough and intuitive enough and also have enough of a clear vision about what they want to decide whether or not you are correct or accurate for whatever their vision is. There are other people who want you to come in and dance around their heads, and uh, they don't have to seem to have that much to do with their day. So uh, you come in and you audition three or four times. I think so. I mean, it's, it's been a phenomenal experience this year because I've had uh, I went up to the network for the first time and I auditioned for a James Garner pilot and it was really kind of fun I mean I sort of bunked out in my car all day with my husband we brought a cooler and had some coca-colas in there and we sort of waited in between these auditions first you come in and meet the director then you come in and read with James Garner and in between these two readings is a period of time where you go out in your car and wait until someone outside goes now it's time for you to come back in. Then you go back in and then you're told to wait for an hour, and an hour and a half. And then the network is late showing up. And then when you finally go in this tiny office room, there's 18 people there. Well, the first thing I said was, I hope everybody's paid for their ticket. <laughs> this is a serious audience. I mean, are you people ready to laugh and frolic? And I mean, you know, I hope it's worth it for you. But and this is amazing. It was just a, such a, a new system for me. You know, uh, you have a body of work and people have seen it and yet there is this system that you must go through in order to, to work as an actress. So, I mean, what the hell? I mean, if that's what they want, that's what we give them, you know? The I mean, what the hell? Is, when I, I interview a lot of young emerging actors and actresses, young people coming up, and they all seem to be auditioning for the same roles. So one of the questions I always ask them is, who else was there auditioning for your role? Who are the same people who keep coming in for these parts? You know, you actually, run into the same people? Yes, absolutely. And On and occasion, they don't even have any respect for the fact <coughs> that we don't want to necessarily run into each other, you know? <laughs> so, <laughs> but it's okay. I mean, I have a very good sense of humor about all that. That's part of our job. I mean, you know, why, are, why is anybody afraid to go back to the beginning? Because that's really where the fun was. The day you made over $250, all the fun went out of it anyway, you see. So it's okay to go back to the beginning and to, and to uh, you know, exper experiment and experience auditioning again. Um, are you doing it with the same um, level of actress that you are, or? On occasion. Uh, yes. Uh, very often. Sometimes not, but that's not me. I'm not in the casting department, you know. I mean, I just go up if I feel that I, I want to <laughs> try to get this part. I will go in and try. Bob Rafelson had me up to read for a film that he's doing with Jack Nicholson. There were exactly two little scenes with about four lines in one and about six lines in the <laughs> other. And I, I was really fascinated with the whole process. And then in the middle of the audition, these lights go, well, not in the middle of the audition. It's like at some point he decides to film it so you're sitting there and these little lights go bing 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 and there's sort of bright lights like that and you go ha ah. and God said let there be light and then a little guy appears from nowhere with a camera and Bob says we're going to film now and I'm saying I'm so glad I thought you weren't going to pay me for this oh. <laughs> so happy to know I've got the job but anyway they go on and they do this now on film everybody has their own way of going about it but I must say in the old days they just sort of saw you work and thought you were wonderful and they called for you and that happens too see so I mean I'm it's sure um, it does. but there is a different system now and um, I remember I was talking to a wonderful director and he said you know years ago so many agents called me to put forward their actors <laughs> for whatever job there was and he's quite a famous director and he said now only six agents have the courage to call is that right because it's the casting director that controls whether or not you get in to see the director that's very interesting it's it's almost like a new element it's has come absolutely. up absolutely so i did this importance. phenomenal thing the other day there's a film that ron howard is directing called an irish <laughs> story and i heard that there was a part of a madam and that she had an irish accent and i'd been working on shirley valentine and i knew how to say started <laughs> and you know like a glass of wine and all that right. so i thought well gee if he hasn't cast it i think I think I should see him. So I just cut right through protocol 
and called up his office and said, hi, this is Brenda Vicar. I just wanted to know if I could talk to Ron Howard because I heard he hasn't cast the part of this lady in this movie and she's supposed to be a madam and I'm fabulous <laughs> at playing madams. And I just thought maybe I'd cross the line here and say, he's an actor, he'll understand. I really would like to meet him and talk to him about this and I think it would be great if he would see me and you never know, there could be magic here. Never got to see him. Is that right? No, but I did it anyway, and I thought that it was, I, I was glad I did it. I think you are. I think so that's right. So what? Why. You know, you have won awards with women directors. Yes. Do you think that makes a difference? A woman no. Do you, you don't feel any? You just No. I mean, I like to work with women directors, but I don't think that it makes any difference in terms of why you win that award or anything, but I do think they're very sensitive and they're very um, uh, wonderful to work with. I've had good experience. I loved Susan Seidelman. I think she's an extraordinary director. She knows what she wants. I think we have a I like clip that. from Cookie. Oh, you do? Yeah. Would you tell us a little bit about what we're going to see? I think you're going to see something with me and a <laughs> dog. That oh, okay. whole part was me and a dog. Okay. And of course my darling Peter, he was there. But anyway, I, I think it's a cute clip. And we'll talk about the dogs afterwards. Yes. What you're doing for them. My little fur people. Right. Okay. <laughs> Oh, look at this mess. I told you, if you're not going to use the tablecloth, use the goddamn coasters. I don't like rings. Somebody going to a christening? It's a wedding, okay? Now that you're a big superstar in all the papers, why don't you spend a little money on this place? Jesus Christ, Bunny. If you don't like it here anymore, why don't you move back to jail? You know who's going to go to jail? Yeah, who? You with those stolen dogs. Regrooming stolen dogs and selling them. I have to go if you don't mind. One of these days you're going to get picked up for running a chop shop for pets. Ah, shut up. Damn it. Your car is blocking my car! I can't hear you, Bonnie. Speak up. Move your goddamn car! Move it yourself. God damn it! I'll move this car. I'll move it right up his ass. Son of a bitch. Get in there. Sit down. Start up! Don't turn off. Well, we're glad you didn't stay in the car. I knew it would have been backdraft. <laughs> <laughs> such a good time making that movie. Was it I had the great? Oh, yeah. I love Peter Falk. He's my doll. I had such a good time with him. You it was know, a fun movie to make, and we were in Brooklyn. I was going to say, did you have to work on your accent? No. <laughs> my just... cousin Teresa, don't worry about it. This is how she talks. I have some way to go, if Perfect. you don't mind. Is that it? That's so how just... she talks. Yeah, she was there. Yeah. Brenda Vaccaro acts, dances, sings. Who is the real Brenda to you? What do you mean? Of those three? Yeah. The one that sits and reads. Oh, is it? I was <laughs> well, the one who travels. The one she who travels and loves her husband and has a peaceful life I with all know, my animals. But you've turned down uh, several projects. Yes. On and, occasion, I've been known to do that. And why and what? I well, it maybe... just depends what it is, you know? I mean, sometimes it's just not the right timing or it's you don't feel that you can really contribute to this part or there's not enough money or, you know, I mean, there's just a lot of reasons. Or you, your heart's not really in the part. You uh -huh. know, you don't really feel that you really want to do this part. I don't know, as you get older, you get, you know, there's different reasons that things <laughs> happen to you, that you feel this way. <laughs> I don't know why. What are you doing now? Um, I'm traveling. 
You I've done a lot of travel. traveling. Yeah. You love to I just travel. did a bunch of voiceovers for Nutrisystem for the radio, which was great fun. I did that in Philadelphia. And then we spent two weeks in New York going to the theater and walking and just getting a good shot of New York because I love it so much. Good shot in the arm. And, um, and that's about it. And when you, know? you talk about staying home, do you cook? Yes, I do, when you, I can are eat. Are you that Italian cook? When I'm a very good cook. Yes, but you have When ghee. I can eat. You have ghee to cook for. Yeah, I do. And he loves to, he loves to eat my cooking. So, I mean, that's, that's fine. When we have time and we're home a lot, I get, I get into that. I enjoy it a lot. Is it always Italian? Mm, yeah, well, some Chinese. I've gotten into do Chinese, you? yeah. I mean, I buy that little stuff in the market, you rip it open and pour it in and oh, all of a sudden it becomes sweet and sour. That's how easy I do that is. kind of Chinese cooking, you know what I mean? <laughs> but it's fun. It's fun. I enjoy it. And I enjoy home life. Well, mm -hmm. tell us what you like about L.A. I know you travel a lot, so you should know. Oh, well. No, you know, I came up with a line about L.A., which I, after I'd lived here for a while, that I thought was quite appropriate. It was about after a year I was here. I said, I know what's wrong with this place. You have to hire an architect to meet one. Oh, that's <laughs> That was and it was like the scary thing to me because I grew up in New York and we always met different people from different, you know, places in life, different functions, different work. Oh, and and it was feel. a melting pot. And here I kept running into people on their way to the ladies' room, listening to somebody like, I don't know, who at the bottom of a stairway say, take Missouri breaks. You know, it was <laughs> always like work talk or people in your same industry. And I don't know, it became extremely boring for me because I was a New Yorker. And for me, it was great to meet a geologist, a scientist, a writer, gay to lease at the, oh, you know, yeah, I mean, sure. it was just always a very stimulating life for me in New York. And I found that this could become a very isolated, rather insular life. And I'm, love a, I'm a city person, that's all. I don't have so, anything against Los Angeles, just, yeah. just some people thrive in the city and I'm, I fear that I'm one of them. I think you've thrived here long enough, though. Yeah. You've done very well here for it's a long It's been good. Time. I mean, Los Angeles has yeah. been good to me. My you've industry's been, been good to me. I'm yeah, a happy lady. You've been yeah. great. So we're going to take a break. Okay. And we'll be back. Okay. Great. We're back, and joining us is Patrick Ela, who began his affiliation with the Craft and Folk Art Museum in 1975 as the administrative director. He was subsequently appointed director of the Los Angeles Museum in 1985. Patrick, was this an unusual way to come about to become a uh, director of a museum? You weren't a curator or you weren't really an arts person per se. Well, in about 1970, there was a, a group of universities, including Harvard and UCLA, who began a program called Arts Management. And generally, uh, those were through the graduate schools of management or business. And uh, so I pursued my uh, advanced degree in the School of Management at UCLA, but I had actually uh, studied art history and been an art major in college. Uh -huh. And I, um, I uh, had uh, actually been a curator at Gemini Graphics oh, before, you were. before I went back uh -huh. to uh, graduate school. And so I had both a curatorial and an administrative background. And, uh, Anyone who's been involved with nonprofit organizations knows that you need to have a certain modicum of business experience to deal with potential donors and raise money and write grants and run the place, basically. So I, I think it's a, it's a great idea. I think you do need to know uh, how to administer the museum. I think most of the time directors say all they're doing is administering rather than directing. But what is the difference between a director and a, a museum director and an administrative director? Well, I think uh, certainly the, the director has the responsibility for curatorial decisions as well as, uh, as administrative decisions. And uh, one has to be knowledgeable about art history and, and about donor relations and collections building and where uh, the exhibition program is going, how it all works together. Whereas an administrative director uh, works in tandem with someone who has the artistic responsibility. When Edith Wiley and I were working together in a collaborative way, she had the programmatic responsibility and I had the administrative. And Edith Wiley was the founder she of the museum? She was the founder and director emeritus of the Craft and Folk Art Museum. Which started on Wilshire Boulevard. Did she right, start it on Wilshire? 1965. It was started as the Egg and the Eye, and then it grew in 1972 into the uh, Craft and Folk Art Museum. Why the two names, Craft and Folk Art? 
Is there a difference between those two there elements? Is. There, there is, and, and uh, it's a very complicated uh, set of uh, issues, but I, I will try and make it as uh, simple as I can. Um, traditional crafts or, or folk arts are usually in, uh, in traditional societies, but in our contemporary society, which in many ways is post-industrial, uh, people, people are involved in making crafts and, and uh, art actually out of traditional craft media, clay, yes. fiber, glass, metal, and wood. And usually in the past, those were only functional items. Now they're items of artistic expression. And, uh, and so in folk arts, we're dealing with, with objects from traditional societies. And in crafts, we're talking about things from contemporary and traditional societies both. I don't know if that makes it a little clearer, but. But you mix them both. We mix them both because they're on a continuum. And design is in there, too. Uh, if you deal with living, if you live in India in the 14th century, or if you live in Los Angeles in the 20th century, you need things to eat with, you need things to wear, you need all kinds of things, uh, things to get around with. And how you address that issue of living uh, results in objects being made, cups, uh, clothing, but and whatever. Through a craft point of view, though. From a craft point of view. But uh, in a traditional society, Westerners might think of those, uh, if we go to India, we would think of those craft objects as folk art. Oh, they would think of it as craft. Uh, and, that's what and, I so, and so that's why they're interrelated. It's, it's, if we, we take an international or a worldwide perspective at the museum, and so we see the interrelatedness of craft and folk art. I know you cons you've consulted for Malaysia and for India, and I was going to uh, ask what kind of consulting you do for those people, because their contemporary crafts really come out of their folk art or from their past. So how do you differentiate? If something's made today, and it's made exactly in the manner of a great master who taught that person or right. taught it all the way along. Where is the fine line? Is the old piece the good piece or is the new piece the good piece? The new piece can be just as good as the old piece. It may um, be more valuable because it's rarer, but... Uh, the old in, piece, yes. The old piece is rare, but in time, the piece made today will be, uh, will be just as uh, valuable. There are, there are contemporary woodworkers in the United States who make uh, uh, rocking chairs and, and other uh, handcrafted objects that sell for twenty or forty or fifty thousand dollars? I mean, oh, I so it's not it's it's not just about age. It's about quality and and uh, sensitivity about design and, and artistic expression. What would those countries come to you in uh, aid of? What what do they need you to help them with? Well, sometimes I talk to them about uh, museological practices, about conservation and oh, curatorial procedures and display and administrative things. And, I see. and uh, when I was uh, in India speaking at a conference called Crafts India, um, we were talking about this very thing you're asking me about, the interrelatedness about how do crafts in the so-called first world relate to crafts in the third or developing world, and, yes. and so on. And, and basically, there's a, there's a continuum of, of intent. The object is made for something that's similar in all cultures, but the, uh, the materials and the technologies available to each society and their value systems make all the objects come out differently because the artists are they come from a different background. Different, right, different background. But um, say, would folk art be collected at the LA County Museum? Is there a collection? There are, there are objects of folk, uh, what one might call folk uh, art at the, at the uh, County Museum. And, and the Modern Museum in And the New Modern York? Museum has, in fact, one of our first, uh, our earliest catalogs on, on folk art that was published in the early 20th century came from the Museum of Modern Art. And it was uh, an exhibition of, of uh, objects from, I believe, the Hemphill collection. But uh, then, then why, why then the folk uh, craft and folk art museum? Why do we have a specific yes. museum dedicated to it? Well, uh, in many instances, the uh, the folk art is is uh, represent represents cultural values, and there are, as you know. 80 or 90 languages spoken in Los Angeles every day, and each of those represents a, a culture and a, and a background. And 
uh, those aren't all represented at the uh, County oh, Museum of Art or at the uh, or at the Museum of Modern Art for that reason, and and. Uh, we feel that Los Angeles is also a center of, of design, uh, and California is a center of contemporary craft making. So the, the confluence of, of the folk art from the rich traditions that make up Los Angeles and the uh, uh, design and the, uh, and the uh, craft of California make the museum have a very rich purview that's not covered extensively by the other museums. So we feel very complementary to the but other museums. Are there other great uh, craft and folk art museums in the United States? Yes, there are. There's the, uh, there's the American Craft Museum and the Museum of American Folk Art in New York. Uh, there's the uh, Museum of International Folk Art in, uh, in uh, Santa Fe. There's a folk oh, art, right, craft and folk art museum right. in San Francisco. And in Wisconsin, there's a Kohler Art Center, which deals with these same things. Chicago? Did they? Chicago just... doesn't have one, oh, not I to th my knowledge. Oh. I know you've sat on a lot of panels. And what do you discuss? Basically what we're talking about now? Or, or uh, what are some of the topics on the panels that you? Well, like at the National Endowment for the Arts, for example, um, uh, when they convene a uh, panel in, in uh, review of exhibitions, they try to have someone who's expert in Asian art, someone who's in contemporary American, traditional European folk art design, so that uh, when an application comes up, there's someone who has a certain amount of expertise who can inform the other people about uh, what's valuable in this application and what's not. It's just, it's impossible for every, everyone to know Everything. Everything. So, so your panels are for people from museums or people from the outside or for both. Everything? I mean, I, I I speak on a number of different panels uh, uh, related to administrative things as well as uh, content of of the museum. I see. So now I know um, you have plans for a new museum. We're building a new museum. We wish the economy were a little better, but we've done very well so far. We've raised well over half of our goal. And we're going to uh, occupy the first mixed-use building in Los Angeles. Which will be where? Which will be on the corner of Curson and Wilshire, right across the street from the uh, La Brea Tar Pits and the Hancock Park area, where our old museum was. And uh, we hope to occupy it in 1994. Great. I know right now you have an exhibit of glasses. Spectacular spectacles. Yeah, right. we have a couple of things here. Right. These are uh, works by Judith Hoffman, which are on display in our museum shop. Let me just put this on. And those are spectacles for viewing dark places yes. that Joan's wearing. With the, with the fish. Do I have right. fish on this? Yes, you do. Yep, for my uh, sign in the zodiac. Two fish here. A uh, Pisces. Yes. Yeah. And this one, this one is uh, star. Uh, our spectacles for measuring starlight. Great. And we have the uh, star. I don't on know it. if we got. We can get a close up on that. It's very. Oh, there. I think he's got okay. it now. Great. And here's the. Um, here's the invitation. Right. The the exhibition runs through. Through um, the uh, summer, the, I think. Through the summer, yeah. through the eleventh uh, of August, and it, it traces. Uh, the development of eyeglasses, which were created in the 1100s, 12th century, All the way up, till now. Uh, up to now, and we really focus on the LA Eyeworks collection, which uh, uh, is uh, concentrated in eyeglasses, fantasy eyeglasses from the 40s, 50s, and 60s. Well, our time is up. We have to stop. But thanks for being with us and give us a quick little uh, minute, a second on what you think.